A very good morning to all the participants and our distinguished speaker. I'm Aradna Nodial, designated as Technical Superintendent, and on behalf of CEF CRNTS IIT Bombay, take this opportunity to welcome you all for the today's talk on electron microscopy titled Scanning Transmission Electron Microscopy, STEM and Related Techniques, which will be presented by Dr. Mohammad Riza Iskandar. Before we proceed, I would like to give a brief overview of CEF IIT Bombay. CEF IIT Bombay was inaugurated by our late ex-Prime Minister Sri Morarji Desai in the year 1976. DSD has set up CEF in various parts of the country with an objective of providing guidance for data acquisition using sophisticated analytical instrument. This slide explains how CEF and CRNTS were established over the years. Currently, Professor Anil Kotin Tarail is the head of the department. We have around 16 major equipments under CEF and five major equipments under CRNTS. CEF IIT Bombay provides measurement services to researchers at IIT Bombay as well as to the users from various academic institutes, national laboratories and industries. The current slide shows us the facilities at CEF IIT Bombay which are funded by DST. We have upcoming dual beam focused ion beam FIB which is under installation. This slide shows the facilities at CEF CRNTS, which are funded by IIT Bombay. Today, we are going to highlight the three transmission electron microscopes. One of them is a conventional TEM and the other two are field emission gun based transmission electron microscopes with different analytical capabilities like the 200 kV FEC TEM has energy dispersive spectroscopy attachment with it and the 300 kV FEC TEM has EDS and EELS as well. All are in-house at CEF CRNTS. To get more detailed information about CEF, you can visit us at cef.iitb.ac.in where the information about the instruments housed in CEF IIT Bombay is available. Also, you can get the procedure to avail these facilities. At CEF, we receive samples from all the states of India as well as from our neighboring country, Nepal. We also encourage users from various academic institutes, national labs and industries to visit our facilities. You can join us on our LinkedIn account to get the latest updates on instrument webinars or any upcoming events held at CEF IIT Bombay. This is the brochure for the ongoing webinar series information for which is listed on our LinkedIn page as well as on our CEF website. All the instruments at CEF IIT Bombay are operated and managed by dedicated staff. We would be happy to welcome you all and happy help you with the analysis. Now I introduce to you our today's speaker, Dr. Mohammad Riza Iskandar. He is an application specialist from Thermo Fisher Scientific. He got his PhD in Material Engineering from RWTH Aachen University in Germany. Before joining Thermo Fisher Scientific, Riza was working with as a research scientist at Central Facility for Electron Microscopy, RWTH Aachen University, and Ernst Raska. Center for Microscopy and Spectroscopy with Electron at Research Center, Julik. He has more than 13 years of experience in a variety of transmission electron microscopes, including abrasion corrected ones and analytical TEM techniques. We are sure that this talk will enlighten the knowledge of researchers to use the electron microscopes for their research purposes. Just an important note, Queries related to today's talk should be posted in the question and answer box only. We will be posting the feedback form shortly. Kindly fill it. So let's commence today's talk. Over to you, Dr. Riza. Thank you very much for the introductions. 
It's an honor to be here in this webinar. And today I will share with you one of the important techniques in TMs known as scanning transmission electron microscopy. So, uh, yes, and um, uh, once again, so today I will I will share with you one of the um, the important techniques in TMs is known as the scanning transmission electron microscopy, which is in many cases can provide more information than a conventional TM. Here is the list topic that will be discussed today, and I will start with the overview of the scanning electron microscopy or STEM and followed by all techniques applicable to imaging, diffractions, and also analyticals. So let's start with the first one. Um, we all know that um, transmission electron microscope or TMs is used to magnify small objects or used to identify a local structures from these small objects. This is possible as the electrons will produce a sort of wavelength compared to the visible light and will push the possible highest resolutions as we can see in the uh, uh, table below. Um, so, uh, but with the scanning capabilities, oops, uh, sorry, why, why it changed? Sorry, okay. So with the scanning capability, a transmission electron microscope um, can do even more. So as we can see here from the index map, uh, we can see the small particles of gold uh, in red is surrounding by the nickel particles that uh, in, in greens and also a couple of the particle from chlorines in the light blue. So furthermore, with STEM, once again, we can also study a chemical bonding for the samples. Here is an example how the cerium oxide uh, oxidation state map can be, can be mapped using this uh, ILS technique that I will come to more detail about that, where we can see that how the cerium 2 plus and also cerium 3 plus uh, oxidation state can be imaged. Um, STEM itself is a very different with, from the conventional TMs because it uses a focus beam yeah, and, and it scan over the samples as the scanning electron microscope do. In fact, this is the scanning words come from. Uh, as we can, sorry, as we can see from the image here on the left side, that the stem can simultaneously collect a different uh, signals to form image or also to use it for the analytical purpose. Um, detector from the image uh, lo locate below the specimens where we have here the HADF detectors, BF also bright uh, BF detectors, and I come to more detail about these detectors in my next slides. We can also analyze the samples uh, using the uh, to get the best or the highest possible resolutions than other techniques can provide. Uh, as example, we can analyze the sample using the energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy or EDX, where the detectors locate above the sample here. Or we can also uh, analyze our sample using the electron energy loss spectroscopy where the detector or the filters locate below on the samples normally. So um, uh, these two techniques can combine into the very powerful techniques because we know that the EDX is a very valuable when we try to investigate the heavier elements, but on the other hand that the EELS can very powerful to investigate light elements. As I mentioned that the stem is equipped with the HADF, uh, DF, and also BF detectors for acquiring images. Um, here's this, uh, some schematic how these detectors uh, uh, locate in our uh, TMs. So we have the, the first one, we have the HADF detector, or we can also call it as HADF detectors. It's a basically a single electron counting detectors. It collects in, in, in coherence uh, electrons that are scattered at the high angles, typically above uh, 50 uh, millirads. And then it will produce a, a Z contrast image. So we can see here, this is an example for that, how the precipitates that form in the salt pin aluminum alloy 1775 solves as the uh, brighter uh, um, regions. So there is also another detectors that we call as the dark field detectors. So uh, the, this, the, these detectors um, collect electrons that scattered at the intermediate angles. 
So this is uh, similar to the uh, conical dark field in the coefficient TMs, basically. But and that at the ends, it will be produced a contrast from by the electrons the, that diffracted on scattered at the intermediate angles. So as an example, we can see here from the DF2 and the DF4 image, this is basically a type of the image produced by the dark field detectors. The last detector is a bright field detector. It collects partially coherent electrons uh, that the scattered or not scattered, if it's scattered in the very small angles. And the contrast that we will see here, this is the example of the bright field image, is look similar to what we have in confessional TM. Uh, this is an example how the experimental of uh, HRTM and also HR stem images from the uh, lanternium hexaborate uh, specimens at the crystal plane of uh, 100. So what we can see here from the high resolution TM image is a very compact atomic arrangements of the lanternium hexaborides but on the other hand, uh, this, the, the high resolution stem HDF image can show is a more apparent titanium atom positions. So this is actually what I mentioned that I showed in the previous slides that the high resolution stem image is, is, is very is, is, uh, much easier to understand compared to the uh, high resolution TM in conventional TM uh, techniques. But once again, in the HADF image, because the contrast is based to the Z contrast, means that we can only see uh, the heavier elements. So this is impossible from the hard depth image to see the light items such as borons. So we do have another techniques to image the light items uh, by um, uh, utilizing the bright field uh, detectors. We call it as the angular bright field image. So by collecting some electrons that slightly uh, defected, and then uh, we can uh, produce an image uh, which actually the contrast is inverse than the hard air. So it means that here we can see the atom column as the dark spot compared to the hard air where this is the bright spot. And in the end patch area here, we can now see where the latanium atoms and also atom borons locate. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, that uh, one of the advantages of the stem is that the image relatively easily to interpret. An example, it is the focus independence. So I have here one example. So we can see here on the left side how the high resolution TM's uh, image look like. So by changing the focus only about two nanometers, then we can already see that the different uh, features can be uh, uh, show up from the high resolution TM image. Uh, but compared to that, if we have the high resolution stem, so even we change the focus up to 40 nanometers, so what we have here, if we enlarge the image, so we still have the same uh, structures, atomic columns, without uh, significant changes if we change up to 40 nanometers. So that's uh, the reason also to, 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 to see that uh, it is easier to interpret the hydrogen stem image compared to the hydrogen TM image. And to uh, a good detector is uh, very important to produce a good stem image. So, I mean, normally we, every, we, we can use any kind of uh, HF, uh, HADF detector image, but we need to make sure that the detector that we have can produce a higher gains and also lower noise. So then at the end, we have the signal to noise ratio is quite high. This can be done if we are using uh, quite new uh, techniques that we call this as a fenter stamp detection systems. So I will try to give you a couple of examples how what this uh, signal to noise ratio is uh, very important, especially in the stamp uh, image. So here, this is the example how the printer detectors can produce a high quality stem image at the low currents. So what we see here, this is the strontium titanate high resolution stem image at the different currents from t, uh, 3 picoampere to less than 1 picoampere. So what we see here is a very nice the intensity or the signal to noise ratio can be produced with this new uh, uh, detectors. Uh, we can also see in another comparisons between these uh, new painter uh, stem detectors 
compared to the previous detectors. Now we keep the probe currents the same. This is three uh, picoamperes. And once again, now we can see it clearly how nicely that this is a signal to noise ratio can really image using the Panther stem detector. So this is very important to understand these conditions because uh, the one thing, uh, although the stem has the many advantages, but this is about the signal to noise ratio because what we we'll get the image is from the scanning process and then collected the data from the detector means that to have a good detector is the main, uh, the very important things uh, to understand regarding this uh, scanning TM uh, imaging technique. So, so uh, to summary up at the first uh, topic that I talked today is this uh, once again the very importance that uh, to produce a very good stem image, we have a good hardware to, to provide this uh, good image. Uh, now, after I talk a little bit about the hardware, I will go now move to, to the next topic. Now we will take a look from the application for, for, for the so software, how the, the, the good hardware and also combine it with the good software that can really uh, give us the better image uh, quality. The first technique is about the drift corrected frame integrations or DSFI function. Uh, so we know that obtaining a high quality stem image often takes about 10 to 20 seconds. Uh, and during these times, there are many cases where the effects of visual uh, fit movements are due to the chargings, also drift, noise to the vibrations, etc. become problems. This is what we really have here in this movie. So either we have a noise, yeah, because the quality is not that good, and then also some uh, drift, yeah, because then probably after we inserted our samples, and if we increase the, the acquisition time, then we will see some distortion. So of course, regarding the distortions, regarding the, the longer acquisition times, we can reduce the, the, the scan times, but still at the end, the signal volume problems will stay. Therefore, we will need to use uh, some uh, uh, algorithm to solve this problem. So we use what we call the correction frame integration functions that is easily can be found in the uh, this couple of uh, software like a Felox user interface that we have here. Uh, of course, actually, if for, for those who are, uh, those who owns the, the thermofisher uh, microscope, this technique is actually also being built in the operations uh, system such as like a TIA. But of course, in, in Philox, we have a better algorithm and also a better uh, way to do that. Um, so what basically we do that uh, to, to get the better image quality. So in this image, we're looking at the high resolution stem image of the aluminum zirconium alloy. And the left side here is the one frame acquired at the one second. So what we have here, this is the image with a very uh, strong noise. Yeah? The intensity very low and the noise is very uh, huge. So then if we acquire the same image with these conditions in the one frame and then we acquire a total in 30 frames and then, then and later on we sum these frames, then we will become this what we call this DCPI image. So this is basically the sum of these 30 frames. So we can see now this quality of the image is much, much better compared to the first one here. Then here we can really see clearly how the aluminum zirconium precipitates along with the aluminum iron precipitates locates. If we magnify this area, even now we can really see the single atom of the zirconium. You can see here the, the, the bright spot here are the zircon, uh, single atom of the zirconiums. And we can also see the antiphase boundary in this uh, lower part here. Another example is showing the power of the SFI techniques. This technique was used to image the strontium uh, titanate B crystals. So once again, so on the left side, we can see if we use a, a slow scan frames, we can have a very nice image already because the intensity into the noise ratio is uh, quite uh, high. But uh, still, we can see because of the slow scan, this is distortion. If we reduce the, the once again, if we reduce the, the scan times, distortions, we can eliminate it, but the quality of the image is not as good as the live image. That's why once again, the SFI technique, by sum all the image, apply the correction for the drift and, and combine this image, then we can have this very nice image 
very high intensity to the noise ratio and also free from distortions. So this is a very important technique to have. So the next imaging techniques that I want to talk about is the difference, the differential phase contrast, DPC, and integrated different phase contrast or IDPC. Um, as we mentioned in the other slide that the normal stem dark fields contains ring form uh, and then the image formations from the total electrons that arrive in these uh, rings from detectors. This is the previous detector, stem, de uh, stem detectors. On the other hand, the new stem detectors, as, as example, the Panther detectors, although it still have the, uh, the, the ring form, but now it contains four segmented area. This uh, four quadrant detectors is used to measure electron beam deflections caused, uh, caused by passing to the, 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 the magnetic field or the electrode field from the samples. Like here we can see the difference uh, from the X and also uh, Y directions. And then because of that, we can map the electric field also magnetic field from our samples. This is a very good technique if you want to image the magnetic uh, materials. So the, this uh, DPC imaging techniques uh, now is uh, implemented in also in fellow crystal interface can be used once again to image the magnetic field. So uh, in this example, we show you a domain structures and domain walls uh, in uh, M-type barium hexafluorides. This is a very unique, a very interesting material. This is actually a hard magnetic material showing a, prom a promise of the use of magnetic data storage uh, devices and, and actually is currently being uh, developed. Um, the stem disk here, what we see here, the stem disk positions during the experiments will move away from the detector centers due to the influence of the magnetic field that comes from our samples. So, and then if we acquire imaging, an image from each four detectors uh, caused by this is deflection of the magnetic field, then we have this is four images here. And then the safe distances uh, measure from the change of these directions uh, of the uh, image because of the magnetic field, then we can easily measure the shift and then put it into a 2D uh, map like what we have here, that is the map of displacements in one direction from the vertical directions and the other one is from the horizontal direction. So we combine this map and then we can have many possibilities to use this map and visualize that to, in, in various way to, to show the aspect of the magnetic structures. Uh, it can be, if we, 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 can, we can show it as the magnetic field magnitude at the edge points or we can also show it as the field orientations in the color rails presentations, or as we can see here, is actually um, uh, an, an error representations where we can see the information of the magnetic field and also directions uh, of the magnetic field in a single plot. Uh, the IDP system works in the way difference compared to the DPC, yeah, because in here, instead of measuring the electrons deflections due to the magnetic field, we measure the intensity difference over the four quadrants. That we see here, this is green, uh, this is green uh, circles has different intensity of the green color, right? So we measure this the difference intensity for that. But at the end, we, we process the image the same with the, with as the uh, as the DPC, and then as the result, we can have the DPC factor here, and we can image uh, light uh, elements also for the low dose imaging. Here, this is the example how nicely we can see now the dumbbell atoms of the galliums and also the dumbbells of the nitrogen atoms. Previously, we can only see the dumbbell atoms of the galliums. Um, and, uh, several examples, I, I can also show you the profile of the IDPC were taken from the 300 uh, kV abrasion corrected microscope spectra uh, it can be seen clearly in the IDPC image atom columns containing the light elements. The first example here, you can see we have the ADF and we have the IDPC from this material for the lanthanum magnesium cobalt oxide and with the strontium titanate interface. From the IDF image, we cannot see actually where the oxygen atoms are. 
But thanks to the IDPC, now we can see actually the atoms, uh, columns of the oxygens. If we magnify several area here, and we can see that actually not only we can see the atom of the oxygens, but there are different arrangement of atoms from the upper part into the lower parts. At the upper part, we can now really see the atom of the uh, oxygens from the zigzag formation here. Second example, let's say from the barium uh, sodium niobium oxide. So once again, if, uh, in image at the 300 kV, and then uh, from the HIDF, we can only see the heavier elements, but thanks to the IDPC, once again, we can see uh, where this is uh, oxygen uh, atoms locate. One important factor, uh, feature from the IDPC is that it can be also used to reduce noise and to improve the sensitivity. And then it's very important uh, for, uh, uh, to image, especially uh, beam sensitive materials that require a low dose imaging. So when we can, uh, we can see here, this is the example of the metal organic framework sample uh, image at the 0 0.5 picoampere currents using once again the IDPC techniques at 200 kV and then we can measure the electron dose is about 42 electrons per Armstrong square. So if we take a look at this number. This number is actually similar to the dose that normally being used from the cryo loss dose imaging. So we can, so this is a very remarkable result using this IDPC and also the new uh, um, uh, techniques because it means that with such as of the low electron dose, we can still see a very nice and very sharp uh, high resolution stem imaging. This once again is because the IDPC can reduce the noise and also improve the sensitivity. Uh, so in the end, uh, we can saw that the, how the powerful is uh, the difference phase contrast technique. Uh, this is actually uh, an old technique because uh, Professor Herbert Rose first mentions about the techniques in the 1974. Uh, Thermofisher Scientific or FEI made it practical only uh, 20 years later. So uh, I can only suggest for those who want to learn about uh, uh, more about these techniques, I suggest that to check a couple of these publications because. Uh, this is uh, very, very interesting and very uh, important techniques uh, to be mastering with this uh, to, to open our analysis for the all kind of materials. Now we move to the difference imaging techniques known as a scanning nano electron diffractions or SAND. Um, there are several TM illumination for difference electron diffraction mode, right? So the most common diffraction mode we know as the selective area electron diffractions or SAD that use a parallel beam. This is a very common uh, to understand that. And we, have, we, we, we also have another type, the, the convergence beam electron diffractions or CDD. Uh, this technique use, uh, um, as it names, uh, convergence uh, electrons yeah, to, for, to form the, the, the diffraction patterns. Uh, of course, because of that, the CBED or uh, CBD uh, can produce a pattern from uh, an area smaller than SAD. But unfortunately, still not very suitable if we want to investigate the nanoparticles uh, that uh, size is less than uh, 50 nanometers. Because of that, we have two additional techniques that develop uh, for uh, un investigating a smaller objects. We have it first, this is what we call the nano beam electron diffractions or NBAD. But the other one is nano area electron diffractions. So the, the NBAD is basically the same as the CBAD, uh, sorry, uh, CBAD, uh, but only that it can really uh, focus, uh, have a very fine uh, beam size, so it can really use to analyze a smaller area. But on the other hand, the nano area electron diffractions is work like a SAD because it uses the parallel beam, so it means that it will produce a similar patterns like an SAD. But once again, we can change the focus during uh, the, 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 the strength of the condensed lenses, then we can really investigate a small area. Uh, so in the rest of my talk, uh, in this part, I will concentrate to any AD that applied in the scanning transmission electron microscope that we call as the scanning nano electrons diffraction. Uh, here, the schematic diagrams of the electrons elimination system, system from the nanoprobe formations. 
uh, is applicable in the scanning electron microscope to set up to have the scanning electron nanodiffractions mode. The projector systems and also the the uh, 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 of the, the microscopes between the CCD and also the back focal uh, uh, planes uh, is not shown in these uh, diagrams, but we have here the computers and that they control the scanning process and it will position uh, the beam in the specific area and then for that acquire the diffraction patterns. So uh, basically, the scanning nano electron diffraction work that we acquire a, 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 in a stem image at the same time of every single pixels, we also acquire the diffraction patterns using the NAED, nano area electron diffraction. So it means that we will have the sets of diffractions and then at the end we can combine and we can process the, 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 the data sets to, to perform or to produce uh, intensity map based on this electron diffraction. So I'll give you an example for that, so to make it uh, the, the, the information is uh, getting better to understand. So this is an example from the LCMO sample. This is uh, LCMO is a very unique sample because um, uh, this sample has a difference between the nanophase and the matrix at the atomic displacement. So the LCMO belongs to class of the man manganites with the colossal magnetic resistance or the CM. Our effect. Um, this uh, CMR effects uh, peaks uh, near the phase transition from the insulating high temperature paramagnetic or we insert the PM and also to a low temperature magnetic paramagnetic or uh, FM phase. So, but we also have additional phase formed in this LCMO called this is uh, phase uh, CO phase. This uh, CO phase, uh, the size and also the, 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 form, the formation or the coincidence with the CMR effects. Uh, is due to uh, the temperature uh, changes. So um, as the size of the CO phase is, uh, is only about a few nanometers, uh, it's uh, very difficult to analyze the phase using the other diffraction techniques. Because of that, the electron nano diffraction applied, and then we can see that the CO phase, it contains uh, superstructures, uh, 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 superstructures, as we can see here, the, the arrows is uh, show up uh, show us the the reflections that belong to these uh, superstructures. On the other hand, the LCM, LM, LCMO phase that doesn't have any uh, CO phase on it, there's no superstructure reflections on it. So, like I uh, like I mentioned before, so we do we, we collect the all this data from each area that we have from from stem imaging and each pixel we have these uh, patterns. And then we, we process it, we combine it there, and then we can form the intensity map that show where in where it's where's the area of the uh, CO nanocluster forms. And then we can see here from the intensity map here. <clears throat> the, the second example uh, from the scanning nano electron diffractions, we can also apply it to, to check the diffractions orientation of the multi grains and the nanostructures of gold disk. The, the image A here, this is a bright red image of the null structure of the gold disk, and the B is the selective diffraction patterns acquired from the SND. So we have three different regions from these diffraction patterns, the region one, two, and three, and then by integrating the intensity of the each grain, uh, sorry, each area, then we can perform a specific map that show us the different orientations of the crystals that belong to this is gold disk. As example, in the C, because we don't have any reflection on it, so we can only see like uh, some uh, uh, homogeneous uh, diffractions on it. But in the E, as example, that we can, we have integrated the whole reflection here, then we have different grain orientations uh, that based on the scanning uh, acquired imaging. So as I mentioned in the first slide that the stem uh, normally have the problem regarding this uh, distortion because uh, this is very common problem in the stem imaging techniques. But we can see that in this experiment from the SAND, the drift is uh, very small because we see that at the upper image, the, this is the inis, inia, initial position of SAND. This is only a very small, very narrow drift uh, happens during the experiments. Uh, Okay, now we can come to our 
uh, another part of our talk today and I will talk about the uh, and after we talk about the imaging uh, that apply in the STEM uh, 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 mode and then also we already discussed about the diffractions. Now we come to the, the analytical uh, point of view. So we, I will talk about the advanced analytical electron microscopy and I start with the EDX analysis in 2D and also 3D uh, uh, image. So uh, although one can also do analytical, analytical electron microscopy on the confessional TMs, but definitely STEM has more advantages than the confessional TMs. Uh, we know that from this image that as a result of the electron sample inspections, many signals can be provided uh, and uh, pro sorry, can be um, produced. I mean, sorry, I can, I can be produced and then collected by specific detectors to form images or also this chemical analysis. For the chemical analysis, we have at least two important signals. One would call the characteristic X-ray that we use that to perform the EDS. And then the other one is the inelastically scattered electrons that we use that from the electron energy loss spectroscopy techniques. Um, before I talk in more detail with the, some examples of the 2D and also 3D data analysis, I'd like to share uh, uh, several essential factors that need to be considered when we do the analysis. analysis. So the first is regarding the artifact due to the signal variations. So this image is actually is a, a stem image uh, showing of the nickel based alloy with the intragranular product. So the index map of the nickel and chromium, you can see here, we have the different intensity on it. So this is basically not means that we have different concentrations of nickel also from the chromiums. This is actually due to the signal separation. That's why if you take a look on the nickel chromium ratio map, then you can see that this is really that the nickels and the chromium is actually not no difference in this area. So it's a very important uh, to remember that if you want to do the edX map, please make sure that the area that we, we, we take a look or we investigate doesn't have these signal variations. Otherwise, we have this is kind of the artifacts. And the second essential factors in the DS analysis is the edX detector positions. We can see in the slide that uh, due to the geometric positions of the EDX detectors, uh, we can collect more signal from the surrounding. This is from the gray area, uh, area here. So that's why an, an ideal detector needs to have a more desired X-rays and also can uh, neglect as much as possible the posterior X-ray. This is the reasons why in the normal conditions, uh, when we do the EDX analysis, either the line scan, point measurement, also the mapping, we always tilt our samples uh, in the conditions that will be go to the EDX, face to the detector. Uh, but in many cases, it's not a very ideal conditions, especially if we cannot do that. Uh, let's say our zone axis uh, requires us to tilt our samples opposite direction for the EDX detector, then we cannot do that. Or if you want to do the high resolution EDX mapping, then it cannot be also done. Yeah? That's why uh, in, in normal cases, we can get that by tilting this, uh, the, the sample towards the EDX detector, but not in, in every cases. That's why uh, to solve this tilt angle dependence, uh, we have uh, there is a systems that instead of have one detectors, uh, there is a four symmetrical STD detectors integrated into the columns. So we call the system as the super X. Uh, uh, and then the super X detectors, the whole four detectors, it means that now the four detector will cover the whole direction. Yeah? And then in the total, it has a solid angles about 0 0.9 city radians. And the other things that these super X detectors uh, are windows based means that we can now uh, detect light elements is easier than the, the confessional or the previous detectors techniques. Um, here is the detail evidence that the super X is tilt dependence, uh, independence. So what we can see here from these uh, diagrams, uh, the, the red curve is the count rate measure from the super X detectors by tilting it from the minus 20 to plus 20 degrees. So we can see here that this, the, the change of the count rate number is not that much. 
But if we compare it with the single detectors that only has about 0.3 city radians, if we tilt from the minus 10 to the uh, plus 20, then we can see that the huge difference of the count rates. And, can, and moreover, that if we just compare the, the final count rates between the super X that have 0.9 city radians, then we still we really have a uh, uh, more count rates compared to the 0.3 city uh, radiance single detectors. This is a super X EDX map of the strontium titanates acquired from a non abrasion corrected microscope. So it's not from the abrasion corrected microscope. Uh, this is from the non abrasion corrected microscope, like a Technai, or in this case, it's at the Talos F200X. So it's a very remarkable data because we cannot, uh, we can see the strontium atom columns clearly here, also the titanium atom columns, and even the oxygen atom columns as well, thanks to this is windows less uh, detector systems. Another example, we can see the EDX mapping now is a, once again also the super X, but uh, this is acquired from the abrasion corrected microscope, a titan microscope, show us the multiple layers of perovskite structures of gadolinium scandium oxide with the strontium titanate. So uh, we can see nicely these layers forms, and what this is uh, very good about this image is that it's a very huge uh, image because it contains figure about 2000 pixels, yeah? And the total acquisition time for this image to be acquired is about two and a half hours. So during these two and a half hours, the image uh, being acquired, then no significant drift detected. So it's a very stable condition. Uh, but of course, we know that uh, it's not always in the case that we can do the EDX map uh, that uh, very long acquisition time, right? Because if we have a very, uh, this, the, big, the sample is a beam sensitive, then we can forget about that. So we understand that, then we also have the solution for that. So now, uh, instead of using the super X detectors, we have a dual X detectors, means that in, instead of four detectors, we have only two detectors, but in total, the safety radians, uh, the solid angles from this dual X detector is still larger than super X detectors. It has around 1.76 safety radian. Because of that, we can see even uh, more clear this is oxygen snap compared to what we have in uh, um, um, Super X uh, EDX map. Uh, this is another example how the high resolution EDX can be acquired to resolve the spacing between the two atoms columns. Uh, this is the result from this uh, this uh, prosium scandium that uh, oriented in the 001 atomic, uh, uh, 001 crystal plan. And then we can see uh, from EDX maps that uh, 76 PM uh, between this uh, dysfortium atom can really resolve from these EDX maps. Normally we can resolve it in the normal image, but here in the EDX map, then this data is a raw data. Uh, so that's what I want to show you in this EDX. So this is, uh, how that the detector is to play a very, very cynical, uh, significant role if you want to analyze and we want to achieve the best result in the scanning TMs regarding the analytical uh, uh, capability. So we need to make sure that we have a very good EDX, a very good system to produce this kind of image. So now I move to the 3D imaging, or we call it as a tomography. So although we can see more information with the 3D that I just previously show you, but still in the 3D, we will have more information. So 3D imaging is basically like in the other uh, well-known techniques, of like in many other techniques like a CT scan. But in the TMs, what we do is actually we want to, uh, uh, we, we want to uh, produce a 3D image from the 3D objects. In this case, it's actually in our sample. So we collect a 2D projection of these 3D objects, and then afterward, we, we reconstructed these 3D, uh, 2D projections to build a 3D image. So we do that by acquire uh, 70 degrees image. Uh, uh, we acquire images with the tilt series about uh, 70 degrees in plus minus with the one degree increments, and we'll uh, produce around 141 images. 
So after these acquisitions, yeah, like here, this is the workflow. After the acquisitions, we need to align these images because by changing the tilt, there will, uh, will be some changes in the urgency high, also the focus, and we need to align these images. And then after the alignments, we can, re we can reconstruct the image, and at the end, we can visualize this, uh, this, 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 uh, this uh, 2D projections as a 3D uh, image. But uh, to do this process, to do this workflow manually, is a very time consuming and very difficult. Because of that, we need a software that can help us to do the acquisitions. We need help, uh, software that can help us to do the reconstructions. And also we need help, uh, a software that can help us to do the visualization. Ideally, the software must be uh, uh, operates automatically uh, because uh, it will make sure that the data acquisitions is uh, reliable and good. So the software need to automatically focus the image and also automatically uh, acquire and also store the edX also stem image. And then by changing the tilt, they will also uh, compensate the drift happens also automatically and do the whole process until these 151 uh, images being collected at the end we close uh, the valves automatically to, pro to prevent the, the sample being damaged by, by electron uh, beam. Uh, imaging that the user can do with this kind of systems that in the late of the afternoons uh, prepare everything, uh, put the parameters of this, uh, this uh, software and then go home and the next morning come to the laboratory and then see the data and uh, do the data processing afterwards. Uh, here, this example of the 3D index mapping from the automotive battery anode materials. We can see here from the reconstructions how nicely that we can see the carbon arrangements at the grain boundaries. Uh, we can also do the EDX mapping, uh, 3D index mapping at the higher resolutions. Here is an example of the silver platinum for cell catalyst particles. From 2D image, what we see is actually every silver partic uh, particles are covered with the platinum. But thanks to the segmented surface rendering, it's not true because as there are several particles, like you can see here in the upper right here, letters, yeah, here. So this actually where the silver particles are not covered with the platinum. It's a very, that's why this, this tech is a very important because the 2D imaging cannot resolve this kind of condition. The last example from the 3D imaging is showing the inclusion of the aluminum alloy once again, the 2D imaging, EDS in 2D, show us, show us uh, what kind of inclusions present of these samples. Uh, but once again, in 3D, we can see more information such as how this uh, uh, inclusion forms, what kind of element form. And if we rotate it, then we can see how this morphology looks like after we rotate this, this data. That's once again, the 3D is really, really give us more information compared to the 2D imaging. So we come to our last part of our talk today. So I, I will talk a little bit more regarding the another advanced analytical electron microscopy techniques by utilizing the electron energy loss. So we just I will, I will concentrate only the chemical and valency mapping for this part. Uh, although uh, I won't talk in the detail about these techniques because I believe that the previous presenter was uh, or discussed techniques in a very detailed and very good way. So, but I'd like to show you some basic of the ills just to refresh, uh, refresh our understandings. So, as we can see uh, from this above pictures here, uh, that the ills techniques use uh, the in uh, an elastically uh, scattered electrons. Yeah, after these electrons interact with our sample, right? Uh, because of that, the spectroscopy produced, that here what we see in the, the level part, it contains many features that can be interpreted and used to understand the sample physical properties. So I will talk more details regarding how to understand this, uh, uh, the, the, spect uh, this, uh, the spectra in the next slide. But this is one thing that we need to remember that with the ills, we can really have more information uh, regarding the physical properties. And as EDS, EOS also requires detectors to capture to, to capture the spectrums 
but it doesn't call it a detector normally. We call it as a filter. And then uh, commercially, there are two types of uh, the filters available in the market based on how this filter installed in the TMs. The first one we call as the post column filters, and the other one what we call as uh, uh, in, in columns uh, filters. Uh, and so here, this is the, the matter. We can do the analytical, as I mentioned, so we can have more information from the analytical electron microscopy from the EELS. We can see the information regarding the specimen thickness, valencians, optical response, band structure, or like an EDX, we can also have the uh, compositions. Or what I want to, in, to talk in today webinar is about regarding the bonding and oxidation state uh, by uh, taking a look at the density of the unaccompanied state using the near edge fine structures or illness. But one thing that we need to remember, there is one limitation for the use techniques is about the thickness dependence. So we need to have a very thin sample to produce or to use these all uh, features from the physical properties of the, our materials. Here, this is the example how the illness for the oxidation step can be used to identify a phase because the illness, just, just by looking the profile of the spectrums, we can see up and we can know that there are different phases. Uh, belongs to this area because each of the spectrum at each of the spectra will test up, tell us uh, which spectra belong to a specific phase because of the orientation because of the composition but once again to get this spectra we need to work in the stem because in the stem we can work with the very fine uh, beam then we can make sure that we have the specific the exact area then also uh, we can provide using the very good uh, electron sources, uh, the, the energy uh, resolution is uh, very good in this kind of uh, condition setup. Um, so uh, another example, this is also the stem illness. So this is two grains. And then when we take a look, or we, when we point it out with the illness here, in the grain, we have the ilmenite structures. And an interface, we have another based on the spectrum here. We know that at the grain boundary, we have the hematite uh, uh, phase. I come to the, my last uh, slide from today. So this is another very powerful technique, what we call the spectrum imaging from with the stem eels. So what we see here, this is actually not the EDX map that we already uh, saw before, but this is basically the spectrum imaging acquired using the eels. And the advantage of the spectrum imaging is that uh, it can be acquired in much, much shorter time compared to EDX, means that we can really exclude the contaminations that normally happens on our sample by doing the EDX mapping. And the second advantage is that we can really neglect the neighboring uh, 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 effect, uh, effects. It means that if we have a very narrow atomic columns, uh, uh, the, the distance is very narrow, and then we do the line profile, then the information from the each of this neighboring that arise from this line profile that will make some artifact from our result. But in the spectrum imaging with the eels, we can really neglect about that. So here, once again, we can see nicely the elemental mapping of the barium titanate and strontium titanate. Another example, example regarding the fancy mapping, I, I already talked about that in the, my first slide. But here, once again, we can see nicely how we can map the oxidation, oxidation state of the cerium, uh, of, of the cerium based on the oxidation states. If we use it on the EDX, then we can only see the one map uh, co uh, content of the cerium. We can also do, this is not for the illness part, but this is the surface for the mapping of the NGO crystals. If we have uh, the microscope that can provide the very, very narrow energy resolution, something like here, this is zero, less than 0 0.025 electron volt, then we can really have this very nice surface for those mapping. So um, I hope what uh, my presentations uh, today can give you some insight regarding the scanning transmission item microscopy. I know that this is uh, not a very new technique, but in many cases it actually is a very powerful Especially, we can do, we can combine these three things that I just mentioned: the imaging, uh, the diffraction, and also the most uh, common is the analytical uh, techniques. So, thank you for your attention. So, I give it back to uh, <coughs> uh, to the organizer. If we have, uh, if you have the questions, I would be happy to answer it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Thank Dr. Reza. That was an informative talk. We have certain questions lined up for you. The first question is by Mr. Nitin. He would like to know why the background in STEM HADAF is noisy and how to distinguish between the noise and the weak signal. This is a very good question. Uh, so the intensity, the background of the STEM is a very noisy because basically we collect uh, the intensity using the detectors. So it's a very different different uh, techniques for the Aquarius acquisitions image compared to the TM image. So best, uh, it really depends on the detector's technology. If the detector cannot really contact the electrons that come from this uh, the, the detector's area, then we will get actually this uh, uh, very noisy uh, signals. So we can uh, understand or we can check whether the background is really because of the noisy of the sample of the detectors by uh, try to uh, uh, put the line profile like what we have here. Probably I can uh, go back in my slide to show you. Yes, this one. So we can do that the line profile here and then as long as we have the noise of our samples, then we can see that here as the intensity. So another things that can also produce the very high uh, noise if you have the sample is quite thick. So it's also important, although the stem, uh, I always forget, thank you also for these questions because I also forget to mention, although the stem uh, and, uh, techniques doesn't require the very thin sample compared to the confusion TM, but still the sample needs to be thin to exclude this uh, background uh, noise. Okay, thank you. Another interesting question by Mr. Ankur Sharma. He would like to know about the formation of coherent nano area electron diffraction and ab initial phase retrieval for nano electron diffraction to nanostructure characterization. Very technical, uh, technical questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, basically this is a very, uh, I don't think I can answer it now because it's very complicated. Probably I can I can uh, give the answers uh, uh, perfectly using the emails, that's okay, because it's quite along this uh, descriptions, is that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The next question is, uh, can we investigate the structure of a DNA segment by using STEM? Will the high energetic being destroy the sample during STEM? Uh, this is a very good question. Yes, uh, we can do that, but uh, we need to make sure that um, uh, we have these good detectors because um, uh, we know that this is a very beam sensitive material, right? So we need to decrease. Uh, we need to have a very low dose to get uh, the good uh, this this uh, exact information. So we really need to have a, a, a good detector to acquire this is DOC uh, scandium uh, sample. All right. Another interesting question is, can one study uptake track of calcium phosphate based nanoparticles in mammalian cells using STEM? Calcium? Mammalian cells. Calcium phosphate calcium. based nanoparticles. Uh, to be honest, I'm not so sure about that yeah, because I never done it. But as, uh, basically, and with the stem is uh, because stem work with the scanning. Yeah, so it means that we can really control the intensity comes to our samples. So I expect that this calcium it would be like a, some beam sensitive material probably, but I'm not so sure. Like I mentioned, that I'm not an expert in these materials. But such, uh, let's say this sample is a very beam sensitive, then because we can control the intensity that we use for the scanning, then of course uh, we can we can investigate this uh, kind of samples. Mm -hmm. In what way STEM is better than SEM for nanoscience? STEM better than SEMs. Okay, uh, in, 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 uh, indeed that the STEM is still much better on the special resolutions that can be provided. Because although we have a field emissions SEMs now, we can also go down to one nanometers uh, resolutions, but uh, STEM ones can go lower than that. And then uh, in with the STEM, we can combine it with the another analytical techniques, like I mentioned, 
using if we combine it with the ills then we can have more physical properties uh, i do understand that uh, there are also uh, instruments in the sem instruments that can also do the ills but once again because we are working with the very low high tensions in the sem i don't think that we can get the same information when we are doing stem with the capability ills Thank you. Another question is, what is accuracy of elemental mapping in STEM and what's the difference in this as compared to the elemental mapping? Uh, you mean the, elect, uh, the other the elemental mappings? Another, another item mapping. Uh, very good questions. Uh, in the STEM EDX, like I mentioned before, um, we will face the problems regarding uh, the neighboring uh, effect. So it means that the first, we cannot really uh, know uh, whether the signals really come from the single atoms, what they are looking for, or is actually come from the neighboring atoms. So uh, from the, I would say that probably from the numbers is, uh, from the EDX is the same, it's around probably like uh, five under 5%, five percent, five percent, uh, information that we can acquire and in other uh, techniques uh, actually uh, we can get more in the detailed information like example if we want to do the stem uh, scanning nano electron deflections as NSAID uh, the data that we can get is still less than what we have in the x-ray deflections right because uh, is SND is the same like the electron deflections and the TM it can, can not, cannot only get the, the, the information less than 1%, but in the XRD, we can get achieve uh, less than that. But the problem is in the XRD, we cannot really see the area where we can get this structure information. So once again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that uh, one technique is very, very superior than the, compared to the other techniques. So we just need to combine these techniques to provide the all information that we need. That's why your institute example, I show it that it contains many instruments, then these instruments can really give us any information that we need. All right. Is the working principle same for HR STEM and STEM and how are they different? Sorry, sign again. Working principle for HR STEM and STEM. As how are they different? Okay, this is totally different because like I mentioned that the Harry Susan TMs, the 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 the, uh, the focus it really depends on this is uh, 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 surgical focus. So we we are working with the phase contrast. Sorry, not the focus. We are working with the phase contrast, and we are taking uh, talking about the high resolution TMs. But in the rest high resolution uh, uh, stem, uh, we are just working with the the, the resolutions. It only depends on how fine the focus beam that can be produced. So, and then it means that it is also uh, in, in focus dependence, but not as sensitivity as the high resolutions because of the phase contrast imaging. We need to deal with this, this envelope uh, functions that are very sensitive to the focus. So this is very, very uh, two different techniques. Yeah? The two different uh, uh, um, techniques to produce these uh, images. Last questions for today's talk. How accurately can we study crystal defects using this technique? Okay, uh, it very depends, but um, if we are talking about the size, yeah, the, the defects, uh, the, the defects, the size of the defects, I would say that for the stem, it can go up to the uh, uh, atomic uh, resolutions. Remember when I show you uh, this, uh, Strontium titanate uh, B, uh, B crystals image. Yeah, we have at this is grain boundary. This is some defect, and we can really point it out there. So not only to show the image of these defects, but we can also combine it with the EDX or with an, another analytical technique. So I would say that the stem uh, uh, very very uh, useful if you want to investigate uh, the defects up to the atomic scale. Thank you, Dr. Riza, for answering our questions. We have an upcoming webinar next week on MS-based proteomics for COVID-19 research. The link is provided on our website and registration is now open. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammad Riza Iskander, for giving us your valuable time and delivering us the talk. A special thanks to our head, Professor Anil Kotantarail, for initiating a webinar series of instruments housed in CEF, CRNTS, IIT Bombay. We would like to thank the electron microscopy team and IT team for their valued support. Thank you to all the participants for making this event successful. Stay safe, stay healthy. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.